Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lara Storer. I am the Corporate Partner and Events Specialist at Virox Technologies, makers of PeroxyGuard disinfectants. I truly hope that you're in good health and remaining safe and vigilant in practicing social distancing. I would like to thank all the companies listed for participating and providing content for the webinar series. I would also like to thank ALAS for allowing us to socialize the events on the ACE community and specifically John Farrar, Director of Business Development and Communications at ALAS for all of his guidance and support. Please note these webinars are not sponsored by ALAS and does not constitute endorsement of any of the companies or products being discussed. These webinars are provided by individual organizations that have all stepped up during these unprecedented times and have agreed to provide presentations. Please check the ACE community postings and the ALAS LinkedIn group for additional upcoming webinar details. For today's webinar, all participants will be muted. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit it at any time in the chat located on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we will address as many questions as possible. If we do not get to your question, we will follow up with an email response. This webinar is being recorded, and we will provide a link to the recording to all attendees following the presentation. So without any further ado, let's get started. I would now like to introduce Nicole Kenny, Vice President of Professional and Technical Services at Firox Technologies, who will, present, who will be presenting today's webinar, Wiping Out Infection, Choosing the Right Protocols for Cleaning and Disinfection. So over to you, Nicole. Great, thanks so much, Laura. Welcome everybody to uh, today. Um, if anybody joined us a week or so ago, I guess a couple of weeks ago with the uh, ALS New York, uh, New York group, um, I'm happy to say I'm here, you can hear me, I'm not running down the hallway and starting a webinar out of breath. Um, what I'm trying to do today in, in starting and talking about wiping out infection is, is really kind of a compilation of different uh, webinars that we've been doing and trying to bring forward different thoughts and building upon um, a topic. And so hopefully uh, we enjoy today's session. Um, I do want to bring forward that many of us are likely feeling pandemic fatigue. And it's actually a real, a, a real thing, whether we call it pandemic fatigue or, or some of the other names that are associated with psychology. It's, it's all about the fact that something is ongoing, that our fear has reduced and we don't necessarily always need or see the need to follow protocols strictly. And people throughout the pandemic have asked, you know, what do I do? I, you know, as an ex as a infection control expert, somebody who understands cleaning and disinfection, what am I, you know, what am I most panicked about? And the truth is, and I probably said it to this group, is that, you know, I know during COVID I ate apples from the grocery store that I did not clean. Um, it's not that I let my guard down it's just sometimes you know it's you, you can't live in a bubble you have to be able to you know to continue on our day to day but it's also important in terms of what i call it pandemic fatigue it's also do we have disinfection fatigue so those that are tasked at cleaning and disinfecting every day it's that same idea you're doing the same process using um the same tools, we're not seeing any uh, negative issues if we're cutting corners or making little cheats. And so that's really, you know, the idea of pandemic fatigue with where we are, but also thinking of it as disinfection fatigue. And so this is just a slide in terms of if we're looking at disinfection and all the different things that we need to be, you know, contemplating in building out our uh, infection control program and being able to wipe out any sort of infections that we have in our facility, whether it's specific organisms, whether it is looking at how we're choosing our disinfectants, um, you know, what type of process or protocols that we're putting in, um, what type of chemistry we're looking at, what's the safety factor, all of these. And if you actually were to put a circle around, this picture is supposed to look like Mickey Mouse. I don't know that it's perfect, but that's what I was trying to get at anyways. I've gone into more detail um, in, in the, the process or the discussion of seven steps to good infection control. And when we're talking about wiping out infection, this really is the reason or the, the backbone, because we need to have some sort of backbone, some systemic 
processes that we have in place that we are utilizing in order to build out uh, any sort of cleaning and disinfection protocol, any sort of biosecurity protocol within a facility. And each of the different areas within the seven steps can be as long or as short as you want it, depending upon the type of facility, the type of animals or research that's being done, uh, the number of staff uh, that could be there, um, the level of expertise within the staff, et, et, et cetera. So you can really be as detailed or as non-detailed as you want. Um, and I'm not going to go into every single section today in detail, but what I'm going to do is, is certainly spend, um, you know, time about uh, with the training as well as um, kind of the processes and the protocols uh, in that aspect, as well as the end in terms of the quality control measures, some things that we can put in place we might not think of or, or we're thinking of it in a different way. We might need to turn, you know, turn it upside down and really look at things in a different, uh, a different aspect. So I do like to start with um, the idea that we cannot assume. I think everybody knows what assume stands for, and this is vitally important when it comes to any sort of cleaning and disinfection or biosecurity program, in that you can't assume somebody else is responsible for a task. You actually need to get together, come to agreement, make certain that everybody is is clear in terms of what their accountabilities or responsibilities are and that everything is thought of. This is an area where in my experience, um, you know, with, with all sorts of facilities is where when we're, you know, kind of going back and looking after an outbreak, what happens? Oftentimes the result is around, you know, misunderstandings or assuming somebody was responsible for a particular step. And so these are some of the things that, you know, that we really need to be contemplating. And it's one of the, the primary areas um, that I truly believe in, in terms of being able to be successful. And that's why uh, I start with this one. Certainly risk, as I said, is going to depend upon um, your type of facility. And I think what the pandemic has really shown us is where we often focus on animal health, uh, impact of our, um, you know, our colonies, uh, the animals that we're working with. Now we also need to take into consideration uh, the human aspect. Impact does, you know, a pandemic have on our ability to finish or conduct research or, um, you know, ensure that we're able to maintain our quality, uh, our our colonies, uh, in a in a reasonable and, and way that allows us to continue to work. And so I think. You know, now we need to look at not just the animal risk, but we need to contemplate the human risk um, and looking at areas within a facility that we might need to boost uh, the number of cleanings uh, that we do on some of the high touch surfaces throughout the day. I like to spend time on this regardless of the discussion is the concept of hierarchy of susceptibility. And um, my background in microbiology as well as you know, spending considerable time doing different clinical studies and validating of, um, of cleaning processes and comparisons with different disinfectant chemistries is, you know, it, it's rather difficult. As a scientist, um, I believe in the susceptibility of hierarchy, indicating that there are organisms or microorganisms that are easier to kill than others. Um, and so I think that's really important that we're considering that when we're looking at, um, at, at you know what products we're choosing or what we're doing. Conversely, on the other side, as a as a disinfectant manufacturer, I need to follow EPA's uh, regulations, which specify if we don't have an efficacy claim tested, we can't um, state that we kill um, a particular organism. So it, it's really for me quite difficult because I as a scientist and as somebody who really wants to focus on what is right um, and not focusing on things that are are maybe not where we need to put our efforts. I think really looking at the susceptibility of hierarchy is important. And, and this is really important, particularly when we're dealing with pandemics. And so when we have a pandemic or when we have a new virus, there is a, um, a in, with the EPA, we have an emerging viral pathogen rule that goes into effect. And basically what that indicates is that um, they use a susceptibility of hierarchy. So here we're looking at envelope viruses. So coronavirus falls down here. They are among the easier to kill viruses versus non-envelope viruses or not easy to kill viruses from a disinfection perspective, um, like poliovirus, 
uh, parvovirus, uh, things along that nature. Um, currently now even the rabbit, um, rabbit uh, hemorrhagic uh, disease virus that, that's circulating. So what the, what the rule indicates is that if you have a product uh, that has been tested effective um, against the more difficult to kill viruses, uh, for example, one, a non-enveloped virus, you're going to be effective against enveloped viruses. So, so this is where uh, the list N uh, went into effect and where we started seeing products that were indicated as being effective against uh, coronavirus, many using poliovirus as the representative organism. With rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, which is listed on list N and is a concern uh, within wild populations currently, um, because it is a non-enveloped virus and a small non-enveloped virus, you need to have a product that has efficacy against two small non-enveloped viruses. As long as they have that efficacy, then the EPA um, has then deemed that a product is effective against uh, RDHV. So those are things to contemplate that when um, currently now we're in a pandemic, we may have relooked at the products that we are contemplating or that we're currently using. But moving forward, these are some of the things that we can look at from a day-to-day -day perspective to not necessarily impact our cleaning and disinfection. So if you are currently choosing and using a product that meets the entire requirements for the uh, emerging viral pathogen rule that the EPA has defined, then in the event of a new coronavirus, uh, in the event of a new uh, Khaleesi virus showing up as another example, just pulling that one out, or maybe another parvovirus, you're going to be covered in the event that that happens. And so that's really an area that I would, I would spend and, and, and do some due diligence in. Certainly uh, what we've seen throughout the pandemic and what I have seen across facilities in my time of helping with cleaning and disinfection is the impact of chemicals on our health, not just the health of our, of our animals, and that is important, but certainly what we're seeing, um, the impact of people. And, during the pandemic, uh, what we have noticed um, in terms of calls to poison control is that they've increased over 50% versus last year. So if I look at March 2019 versus March 2020, there was an increase by 50% of calls to poison control because of issues associated with use of disinfectants. Um, chlorine uh, was a huge issue with people trying to use bleach. And of course, you know, at home when we were going into hoarding and you couldn't get your products, then we have what I would call custodial chemists. And we have all these people thinking that, okay, I'm going to go online. I'm going to try to make my own disinfectant and, you know, feel safe about it. And not knowing how to mix chemicals or what can be mixed and can't be mixed, then that runs into um, two issues. And so again, really it's that importance of looking at the type of chemistry that is not going to impact um, our colonies. And we do know that there are different uh, chemicals such as quaternary ammonium compounds that can impact fertility on mice. But then we also want to look at what impact do our staff who are cleaning um, do they have with some of the products that we're choosing to use as well? And this is important in an area that could be an entire uh, hour topic. In order to be effective, um, then it's all about contact time or wet dwell time. This is a study that was published back in uh, 2010 looking at uh, label claims. So the claim uh, on the label, the contact time that the EPA had approved versus what the wet dwell time is. And the wet dwell time, meaning if I wipe the surface, um, how long is that surface staying wet before it has dried? And the study looked at um, a number of different uh, chemicals, um, both diluted and ready to use type products. And looking at the blue bars were the EPA label claims and the red bars were the dry time. And so what we're seeing here is, you know, if we took um, back in 2010, we're just using our typical bleach that we're diluting, uh, contact time would be 10 minutes and it dries within about three minutes. And so what we're seeing here, whether we're looking at bleach, quaternary ammonium compounds, accelerated hydrogen peroxide or phenols, are those more water-based products um, have a ability to stay wet on the surface longer than products that contain higher solvents or alcohols 
However, they're not staying as wet necessarily, um, with the exception of accelerated hydrogen peroxide for the contact time. And what this is indicating here is if you were to, to take the contact time that the product dried, so in, in the example here for quads, and if I was to test the efficacy of this particular quad at three minutes, um, what they were finding in the research was that the, the product didn't even achieve a level of sanitizing. So it wasn't achieving sanitizing or what we would define as providing a, a safe um, surface, um, but it did not achieve the level of, dis didn't even achieve disinfection. So really things to contemplate. And to kind of take that home, we're going to look at this particular video. Um, what we've done here is a comparison between two different products, so accelerated hydrogen peroxide on the left, product A, and a quaternary ammonium alcohol product on the right, and looking at using the same type of substrate, the exact same volume of solution, the same number of wipes, pressure, everything, and really looking at what does that impact have to do on drying time. And what we're seeing here, you know, again, just that visual, when we are using a product that has uh, high alcohol content in it, um, that it does evaporate quite quickly. And so the impact with that is that you're not going to achieve the level of disinfection that you're seeing. So in that particular situation, we're using a product with a three minute contact time, and it dries within about 23 seconds, you're going to have to wipe the surface six times if you are going to attempt to keep the surface wet for the contact time listed on the EPA approved label. This is an example of um, disinfection that works, and it uh, visuals uh, petri plates from a clinical study that was conducted um, at a uh, at a hospital uh, in the United States, um, looking at what happens if we contemplate or focus on not just uh, contact time, but also the process with cleaning. And so uh, the facility, it was a double blind crossover and the facility was utilizing uh, pre-moistened wipes, uh, both for the, the um, quat pneumonium compound products as well as accelerated hydrogen peroxide. And what we have here are examples of pre and post uh, disinfection or cleaning and disinfection. So the center uh, list of um, the Petri plates are showing before cleaning, and obviously the surfaces were quite contaminated. Uh, what we have on the right-hand side, uh, the Petri plates are the products of quaternary ammonium compounds from surfaces uh, within the ward that we were uh, doing the research on, showing that there was a reduction, um, but still significant amount of bio burden uh, left on the surface, whereas the Petri plates on the left-hand side um, our accelerated hydrogen peroxide showing that with a faster contact time, we are uh, in achieving contact time, you are reducing the microbial contamination in the environment. And so this really is, you know, I talked to it a little bit at the beginning, but is your facility suffering from cleaning and disinfection fatigue? And so this is really moving into those processes. What are some of the things that we can do to improve that or reinforce you know, keep top of mind the importance that while cleaning seems mundane, um, it is so, it's so needed. And if we have breaks in our cleaning and disinfection practices, that's really where, regardless of facility type, where we can have issues and where we can have problems uh, with outbreaks. And so certainly there's an aspect of cleaning, and I am using different petri plates uh, as visuals only because I think, you know, we don't have our vision, or at least my vision. Um, I can't look at a surface and tell you what's there. I, I, I just don't have the ability. Um, and, you know, in most cases, things look clean. Um, and so it really helps people when you see that visual of being able to use a Petri plate and do a culture on a surface that many of us would think is clean. Um, and then look at the difference between when we're cleaning or disinfecting and achieving contact time. And so the uh, image on the left here is a, um, a swab from a surface here at Virox, um, which is significantly dirty and not something that I would eat from. Um, the center uh, is looking at the cleaning. 
And so if I'm just simply wiping, um, you know, what am I removing? And so it does highlight the importance of the physical friction, the cleaning, um, all of that action. And then, of course, on the uh, right hand side is what the Petri plate would look like after disinfection and contact time being achieved. So just that difference across. But again, that visual of, you know, we could do a swab on a surface where it looks clean and we can um, show you know, that it's not. And I think people have probably been at conferences where uh, people are using ATP and testing your cell phones um, and really showing that they are, you know, pretty dirty and, and not one of those things that we clean and disinfect with any uh, frequency. I like to show this video uh, just as an example Bacteria of how quickly reproduce very grow. simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, just dividing one bacterium every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion, billion, billion bacteria in one day. In one day. And so, like, as researchers, we we likely know this, and it's not that I'm trying to teach basic microbiology, but again, it's those uh, those types of uh, education tools and things that we can show within our facility to help understand why cleaning and disinfection is, a, is important. And these are also things that we can use when we are trying to um, develop a program and maybe coming up against challenges from money or the need for additional uh, people to do what we're doing. It's, it's being able to use some of these tools, these ways of giving that visual to somebody who is maybe looking at a spreadsheet and looking at things from cost or how do we add another body and some of the additional resources to justify it's not just you know the dollar the cost of the the gallon or the drum of, of solution you're purchasing but here are the things this is what we're up against and then the impact on potential research if we have issues with that and so when we get into our protocols uh, cleaning is really important and it's uh, certainly within uh, research area, an area that we need to contemplate, um, perhaps, you know, partic particularly in vivariums where we have animal housing, um, you know, detect depending whether we're dealing with rodents or larger animals like pigs uh, or even primates, and that we're dealing with soils, we're dealing with feces, uh, food, bedding, all sorts of different things. And so, for disinfection to occur, what we need to do in those areas is going to be very different than, say, within our lab where um, the surface could be contaminated from a microbial perspective, but may not have the, the physical or the visual soil on the surface. And so when we're dealing with areas that um, we need to focus on cleaning, then there really is that importance of what we're doing. And what we need to do for cleaning also impacts our disinfection. And so when we're looking at cleaning and disinfection, depending on the types of products that you're going to be using, we need to look at the chemistry. Um, are we using a product for a disinfectant that has a detergent or not? If it doesn't have a detergent, then we need to use a separate product for cleaning, for that detergency aspect that helps lift soils and remove soils from the surface. And so that's really important in terms of what we're choosing, you know, the ability to have detergency, um, you know, and I kind of visualize, think about trying to clean eggs off of a plate just with water and a cloth versus if we're adding some soap, um, you know, the, our dish, Dawn dish soap or whatever we're using, it helps with that cleaning aspect. We also want to look at the impact of pH and or the type of water that you have. So you may have to um, make some changes uh, with the products because if we change pH, then you can impact cleaning. You can also impact uh, disinfection. Um, and sometimes different products require specific types of water when we're diluting. And so you need to be conscious of the type of water that you're using in that aspect. Temperature is also very important. Uh, for the most part, products actually are designed to be used at room temperature or tepid temperature, meaning that we do not need to be using hot water uh, in order to feel that we're effectively cleaning and disinfecting. Now, this is a misnomer because most of us, if we were trained by our parents, my mom in particular, who happened to have been a nurse, I mean, the water was supposed to be as hot as our hands could handle and not, you know, obviously scald ourselves, but that was in her mind what we needed to be doing. Now we can actually reduce our impact on our environmental resources. We can reduce the electricity that we're using so we don't have to use hot water. But again, we do need to use, read the product labels to make certain that we are using the temperature that's appropriate. It also goes for disinfection 
that if we are dealing with colder environments that we do need to look at either increasing um, the concentration of the product we're doing in order to maintain using in order to maintain uh, some semblance of disinfection or we're having to increase the contact time because there is a correlation between a uh, temperature and contact time particularly as we're getting colder so usually uh, for every um, a, deg a 10 degree drop in temperature, you're doubling the contact time of your product. Um, we want to look at time, and that is all about the cling factor, um, the contact time for efficacy, and I've already showed a video on that, but that importance of making certain that we are applying products in a, in a way that they can actually uh, physically stay on the surface. So if we're dealing with walls, um, you know, using a product that can foam um, and really applying that so you have a visual ability to tell that it's there as well as that it's going to stick to a surface is really important. And then of course, how are you applying it? What is that mechanism? Is it a pressure washing? You know, if you have a, a highly soiled area, are you scraping and removing all of that first, a dry clean, um, prior to applying uh, any sort of surfactant or detergent? And, you know, with some of those stubborn um, soils, are we having to scrub? Um, and so it's all of those put together that makes it important from that cleaning, that physical removal of any soils, um, but also what we want to be looking at to make certain that our disinfection step is running smoothly. We also want to look at how we're applying things. And so when I'm talking to substrate, I mean, certainly this could be for floors as well, but really this is more about the surfaces. So what are those above floor surfaces that we are wiping? Um, or if we're utilizing, um, you know, cleaning of small cages or, or things like that. And so there is an aspect of different types of, um, of cloth or substrate and its impact on um, not just how it absorbs uh, the disinfectant, but how it releases the disinfectant onto a surface. Um, and so what we're starting up in the top here is meltblown polypropylene. This is a, a common substrate used for the pre-moistened disinfectant wipes or uh, the type of dry wipe that you can purchase to then charge with your own disinfectant. Um, looped microfiber, so your traditional microfibers, and then of course cotton terry cloth. And what we run into issues here and what we're seeing, well maybe it's not the best, best picture, but it's the idea of when I have a charged cloth that has solution on it and I start at point A and I'm working my way across to point B, we're looking at how does that cloth release the disinfectant onto the surface. So again, the release equals your contact time, which equals your kill. So that's really important. And as we're seeing through the looped microfiber or the terry cloth, you have different levels or different um, uh, lengths of time, uh, size, square footage, if you will, that the cloth has the ability to provide enough or release enough disinfectant. And so when we're starting to see these dry patches or these areas where there isn't any chemistry being released, well, then we're not disinfecting. And so it really is understanding how far is that cloth going to go um, in teaching people that just because it might still feel damp in our hands, if when we're looking at a surface and it really isn't releasing, then we need to be uh, very conscious of our, of our um, cleaning program. We also need to look at what we're doing. Um, so for many, it's not uh, new um, that there are interactions between the type of substrate and chemistry and chemicals. And I was trying to look for a really good video uh, to demonstrate this, but unfortunately, um, there isn't one that's, that's short enough to show. Um, but certainly when we're using, we've got an example here with your cotton um, your cotton mops that we often use. Well, there's, there's a couple of issues when we deal with, with cotton mops. One, uh, cotton and quaternary ammonium compounds uh, have a bit of an issue in that they bind. So that when you dilute your quat into a bucket like this, if you were to test it, uh, depending on your product, you're looking at six to 800 ppm of quaternary ammonium compound needed in order to be a disinfectant and be effective. Um, when you put cotton into a quat, uh, it actually absorbs and binds onto uh, the mop or the claws. And if you were to then retest that solution, you're going to see a significant decrease in concentration just from the addition of the cotton. The issue with that is the cotton does not release the quat when you're wiping the surface. So you really are using then a reduced concentration 
um, which will then impact your efficacy. The other thing, of course, is when we're using open uh, containers like this, there are a number of studies you know, that talk to bacterial contamination, not just within the solution itself, but how we're handling the mop um, and whether we are just reapplying contamination, bacteria, viruses back onto a surface. And this certainly has been highlighted uh, within different facilities and um, has been shown not just with mops, but also um, with a, a bucket and cloth systems that we might be using to clean above uh, above floors on, you know, countertops, workstations and, and things of that nature. Um, in fact, I know there was one facility that was doing some testing and they were finding their microbial count, um, just doing a heterotrophic plate count, was higher after cleaning than it was before, but just in this one particular area. And so they were able to, uh, you know, take the, you know, do their do their research and realize it was around one particular uh, housekeeping uh, person. And she was trying to be efficient. So she would set up her, her cart um, and have everything ready for her to be able to maintain her area. But her solution, her disinfectant solution, um, was contaminated, and she had been topping up. So just adding product and, and using the same, or making, you know, having it made up the night before, and not understanding the impact. So she actually was growing um, bacteria within that solution, and that was being deposited uh, onto the surfaces while she was cleaning. This also leads to the idea of how we're going to apply product or take it off the surface. And this is an example of a study uh, that looked at the difference between spraying and wiping or just wiping. Um, in this product uh, or in this study, the um, accelerated hydrogen peroxide was used for both um, protocols. And so, you know, again, here is a, an example of products that are effective, but if we change our process or our protocol, we can directly impact our outcome. So on the left, we are using uh, accelerated hydrogen peroxide. The uh, Petri plates were contaminated with a known amount of uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And uh, the, in this particular situation, the researcher sprayed um, the Petri plate and wiped the surface uh, three times. They allowed uh, a 10 second uh, window between the spray and the wipe. And so what we're seeing here is that while, you know, there was a reduction, the original uh, Petri plate was completely covered, um, there still is a significant amount of bacteria left. Whereas if we look on the right hand side, what we are seeing when a surface has been wiped with a pre-moistened wipe um, and allowed to air dry, it's a far better reduction. So you're getting that physical friction, some removal from that, but you are getting the contact time in that aspect. So again, if we're using a spray and wipe application, most of us spray and then immediately wipe off, which means we're simply removing the disinfectant and not allowing that contact time. So if we move into our facilities, once we have ideas of the types of tools we're going to use, um, the type of process or application we're going to use, then we need to look at what is our facility and how do I clean it? And so Really, depending on the areas, um, I'm going to break it down into two different areas or two different types, either what we would call wet cleaning or dry cleaning. And so with wet cleaning, um, you know, you really, the characteristic here is you have an environment where there is a drain, meaning that there is an area for your disinfectant or your cleaning solution or your rinse. Um, to be able to drain and not pool and not impact uh, anything in that area. So, you know, these are uh, maybe larger um, areas. You could have uh, clean areas. We have mobile cages. Um, but these are the things that we need to be contemplating. Do you have a drain? And so if you have a drain, and this is just an example of a, of a larger room, then there's seven steps that we're going to follow. And this is an area where we're going to consider that there is a significant amount of soil that we're dealing with. So first of all, we're doing what we would call the dry cleaning. You are physically removing any visible soil that we're seeing, whether it's bedding, feed, feces, uh, anything along that nature. And then we are going to um, utilize some sort of tool. Uh, generally in these aspects, we're gonna be using some sort of pressure washer or uh, a pump up, uh, a foaming, um, a foaming um, gun, and you're going to soak all the, the surfaces using a detergent 
so that you're allowing that detergent to help pick up the soils and you know make it easier to remove so therefore disinfection can occur and then you're going to use a mechanical uh, spraying and that's going to remove any of the surfactants and allow the uh, surfaces to be ready for disinfection but it's really important that you do have a drying component um, because if you have pooled solution uh, on the surfaces and you're adding your, disinfection, your disinfectant, you're diluting so that you are going to reduce the efficacy of the product. Um, and then depending on your product, uh, after disinfection, then you have, you know, you're going to make certain that the area is ready um, for uh, the animals to come back in. And in many cases, we need to make certain that the surfaces are dry uh, so that the animals don't inadvertently um, consume the disinfectant, which could be harmful to them. And then, of course, depending on the type of, of facility or research, we're going to do uh, stamp sampling to make certain that we're not going to impact anything. I'm going to talk about different ways of doing that later. If we look at dry cleaning, well then this would be facilities where we don't have a drain. And so how are we going to clean large areas when we do not have an area um, for any sort of solution to move? And so that's really a, you know, a contemplate where we need to look at protocols in a different way. So a string mop might not work as well. Um, the ability to foam everything is not going to work as well because we don't have the ability to manage with runoff or um, the extra solution at the end. And so the upside um, of moving to dry cleaning is that you can actually reduce the number of steps. So your turnaround time um, in some of these rooms can be fast. Uh, faster. You're still going to do that physical cleaning, that removal of all the gross soils, and we're still going to do some cleaning, um, but um, your disinfection can occur in some of these cases as one step, um, meaning that you can apply and use a, a tool that allows you to both physically um, attack the surfaces as well as ensure that you're getting product evenly distributed. And so in the image we're here we're seeing um, is the use of a microfiber, a disposable microfiber uh, mopping tool, but something that can be used for both floors and walls. And so that it does allow you to clean larger spaces. Um, different tools can also be used within your fume hoods. You're not having to stretch or get in there, but you're able to uh, uh, touch and, and contract the or touch the entire surface. Um, but in this area, we don't have to really soak the surfaces uh, prior to disinfection. From a process and protocol perspective, uh, dilution in application systems are important. So I have talked a little bit about um, from an application perspective, whether we're going to use a pump up foamer, um, we might use some sort of mechanical sprayer. Uh, electrostatic sprayers are certainly something that's being used. The EPA is uh, just kind of defining their ways of how you can um, apply a disinfectant uh, in that area. And then when you're using products, um, and particularly if you're using a concentrate, it's really important that we contemplate our, our dilution and what type of preventative maintenance do we have in that uh, area. So preventative maintenance, we need to think of an automated dilution system similar to the car. It needs a lube oil filter with routine frequency. Um, and so we do need to have some sort of uh, maintenance within the dilution system. There are O-rings that might need to be changed. The dilution systems will, uh, uh, the needs will, will be determined by uh, the manufacturer. But you also want to make certain that we have test strips to validate that the surfaces or sorry, the disinfectant is being diluted properly. Um, for the fact that if we have an issue with the dilution equipment, that can impact the outlet, the um, the disinfection efficacy. And I have worked with different uh, facilities where um, outbreaks occurred associated with the fact that the dilution control equipment was not being serviced, not being maintained. Um, so really making certain that it is set up properly and that there is a, a, a preventative maintenance program in place to ensure that they continue to work. And this really kind of goes back into the fact that, you know, do we have microvision and we can't see the surface? And so if we're looking at ways of highlighting the importance of cleaning and the importance of surfactants um, on surfaces, this is an example. And certainly we can share the full video. The full video is just far too long to, to share here. But what I have are images um, of what the process is happening. So what we have are um, tiles that have uh, been soiled with um, 
blood and allowed to dry. And we are cleaning those with disinfectants. And so the disinfectant on the left is uh, a quad alcohol product. The disinfectant on the right is um, accelerated hydrogen peroxide. And what we're looking at is, of course, with the second slide is that visually they both look clean. So after disinfecting, after cleaning, they look that look like they have um, removed all of the blood. If you use a hematostick, then a hematostick is something that's easy to give a quick visual look. Um, and you simply just need to put a drop of saline on there and wipe it across the surface. And it's going to pick up if there's any residue of um, blood on the surface. And so what we're seeing on the left is that um, the coloring has turned dark green, indicating that it is a fail, that there is um, somewhere it's between these colors and that there is uh, blood residue on left on the surface. It's accelerated hydrogen peroxide that um, there isn't anything showing, meaning that it was free and all of the blood residue had been removed. So again, just those different ways and tools that we can verify cleaning. Then if we get into validation, there's a combination of you know, how are we validating our cleaning and disinfectant program as well as how are we providing feedback um, to show that it's used. And so what I have an image here is a, a different example, uh, actually pictures taken from a study that I was a part of. And so this is the underside of a toilet seat. Um, and and this is using a UV reflectance. So when we use UV reflectance, it's really good, um, you know, in terms of that visual, it can be done, um, you know, on a secret shopper type uh, aspect, but it can be done, uh, utilized in a training process. And so um, when we're using a UV reflectant, then basically what you're looking at, if you look at the top, this would be, you know, 100%. And you can create you know, some sort of rating or measurement that you're going to use within your facility. Um, but this is when we have freshly applied it and it reflects very nicely. Um, then if somebody has wiped a little bit, you, know, you can determine what do we think this is. And so this is about you know, a 75% or 25% removal, if you will. And this one, there's maybe 25% left versus there's no reflectance. So we've completely removed any of the UV reflectant light. And so that gives um, an aspect, you can go in and secretly uh, apply this to the surface, go back after disinfection and cleaning has happened and, you know, see how effective we are being doing just as a quality check. And we can use it as uh, education. And so, you know, if I look at the benefit versus detriment, well, it is immediate, it's very visual, but it's qualitative. So you're only observing was the reflect UV reflectant material removed. It has nothing to do with validation of whether all of the pathogens have been removed. But at least it's there for a valid, like a that that visual perspective so people can see what they're doing. And so some of the problems are, of course, it's subjective. People might rate in different ways. There's no correlation to bio burden. And as I learned the hard way, there's possibility of cheating. So when you uh, Im put this for use into your facility, because we're using black lights, well, black lights are readily available at uh, many different stores. Um, and so we were finding in this particular study that there was a few uh, cleaning staff that had their own black lights and they were going into the rooms and ensuring that they would check every surface to make certain that they cleaned uh, any of their UV reflectance from that area. So there are some things that you need to contemplate there. Uh, ATP or adenosine triphosphate has been something that's being used uh, with more frequency. And certainly it has some um, advantages and it has some ways that we can utilize it. And so if I again look at the benefits versus the detriments, well, again, it's immediate, it's visual, and that we're able to give a reading back. It's qualitative, it's measurable. So we are actually being able to give, to see that reduction if you're doing a before and after, or if you are setting um, a, a baseline in defining what your level of clean is, and so that the result must be, say, you know, less than 200 uh, relative light units. That is, is the measurement that you get on the ATP meter. Some of the disadvantages are that it's not comparable. And what I mean by that is you can't use ATP to compare two different, two different disinfectant products. And the reason for this is that uh, the chemistry, um, dis different disinfectant chemistries react with the um, 
the test methodology with an ATP that sometimes quench, meaning that you get uh, lower results consistently. Bleach is an example of that. So when we're use, utilizing a chlorine-based product, it will often quench the results, giving um, lower results consistently versus products like quaternary ammonium compounds or other products that have surfactants where the surfactant can actually artificially elevate um, the numbers. And so when you're using ATP, it, it's fine. Once you've set your baseline, determined what your um, number, your reading is, so say we're using 200 R RLUs, then you can verify and use it to validate your process routinely. But if you are thinking of utilizing it to compare against the different disinfectant, you are going to run into issues. And again, I'm happy to share a number of different studies um, on that uh, that have been done over the years. Of course, cleanliness is not an indication of microbial contamination. And again, there are a number of peer-reviewed studies looking at the fact that you can't correlate an RLU to uh, what log concentration of pathogens on a surface. Um, it does have a bit of a higher cost because of the individual um, swabs, um, and there can be some implementation risks if we're not trained in how to utilize it properly, how you need to store the swab, um, and in how you are creating your, um, your baseline um, in determining um, what you're going to be measuring for. And so this is just an example that I've taken from 3M um, as an example of a party that they had done or a study they had done as a third party looking at their 3M clean trace monitoring system um, compared to other products. Now, I'm not here supporting 3M. This is just an easy, nice visual that I was able to show. And it's not that you can't incorporate or utilize um, any of the other ATP program ATP systems it's when you choose your system you need to make certain that you're validating it for your facility and for your needs and that you know what the limitations are and once you have that validation and baseline set then you can continue to move forward but just understanding that there are differences between so if your meter breaks or you've developed your program based on you know the 3m meter and that one is no longer working you need to purchase another one and you choose to then purchase um, you know the charm uh, system you have to understand that you that you're going to need to revalidate what you are doing you can't just continue on because there are differences between the meters themselves and then the um, last area to talk about really is PCR I am not an expert um, I have spent more time kind of looking at how we would utilize ATP as a method for validation um, but I do know PCR is something that um, is used. I've worked with uh, researchers within the swine industry and cleaning of uh, transport trailers for a swine, particularly around PDB, to see can we use PCR as a way to measure um, cleanliness after disinfection. It too has limitations. The biggest limitation with PCR is that it doesn't uh, determine um, infective from non-infective uh, materials. So when you are dealing with different disinfectants, you can inactivate the virus, but there could still be, depending on how they attack the virus, there can be DNA left on the surface. That DNA is gonna be picked up and give you a positive PCR reading, but if we're looking at infectivity, if we're looking at um, you know, viral um, testing, it's going to show that it's negative and that it's not infective. And so this is something that um, needs to be contemplated. And uh, so again, you know, it's readily available. It is quantitative in terms of it's giving you a number. But as I said, you can't distinguish infectivity. Um, and there's no correlation to disinfectant label claims again. And so this is a nice study um, that was done, the group, um, looking at uh, PDV specifically on um, transport trailers. And they did a number of different disinfectants. They did a number of different concentrations, say, of sodium hypochlorite. So you're seeing that the different concentration of sodium hypochlorite even has differences. And they looked at a number of different uh, temperature showing that the temperature also impacted um, the ability. Basically, the conclusion of the study, um, you know, and what they move forward into the next aspect of looking at the, uh, the ability to use it, utilize it in the field was using um, the 2.06% uh, uh, sodium hypochlorate and 
um, the 0.5% oxidizing agent, which was accelerated hydrogen peroxide. Um, and again, when we went and healed, what we found was that while we got PCR readings, um, not every single time, when you got a PCR reading and you went further, uh, the, it was DNA found, but it was never infective. So the conclusion you know, of the study, similar to ATP, you can use it, um, but you have to be careful in terms of understanding that just because you get a PCR positive does not mean that it's infective. It just means that there's DNA there and you can't, you can't provide a, a level of uh, qualitative result from that perspective. So nothing, unfortunately, is perfect. Um, just to kind of summarize up, really, it's looking at, you know, how do we responsibly disinfect? So, you know, going back to defining the roles, looking at what we need, and how do we facilitate the development of a, a biosecurity program? You know, the disinfectant um, compliance, and I, you know, will try not to say dwell time or contact time too many times, but that is so important with to achieve disinfection and to achieve what we're trying to do. Uh, training, again, is so important in making certain that we really are lifting up those that are responsible for, uh, for cleaning and disinfecting the larger uh, portions of our facilities. And then, of course, uh, what are those protocols? So how are they sustainable? Are they something that we are in, um, introducing that we can validate effectively, that we have all of our preventative maintenance in process, that we've looked at the impact of our substrates, the types of tools? Um, and, you know, that we're choosing things that aren't going to impact the animal welfare, um, but we're also contemplating how we are uh, looking at the safety for people, our equipment, because of, co of course that's a significant cost, as well as the, the planet. So really it is kind of like a holistic One Health approach in that aspect. And so just quickly in uh, finalizing from uh, what we have to offer within the lab animal research facility um, is we do have our product called ProxyGuard uh, and we do have uh, pre-moistened wipes. So these are obviously great tools to use above floor, um, smaller areas, fume hoods, uh, research tables, uh, that like. And they are a perfect um, uh, thing to have in human areas. So the ability to wipe down um, some of your personal equipment, your cell phones, your desk, uh, if you have shared computers or things that we're utilizing, as well as um, the use within um, staff uh, areas. Um, so lunchrooms, things like that. So we can help keep not just, we're not just focusing on our research and the animals, but in the event of, you know, the continued COVID pandemic and the fact that we are entering into uh, influenza and cold season, there are going to be more pathogens, more human pathogens coming into our uh, facilities. It's also available in a ready to use liquid. Uh, both the wipes and the ready to use liquid carry a one minute contact time across the board for bacteria, viruses, fungi, and mycobacteria. Uh, so you are going to achieve disinfection uh, with a one step, and there are surfactants within that. And then when we're dealing with larger areas, we do have a concentrate. This is a five minute product um, that carries bacterial, virucidal, and fungicidal claims. All three of our products meet um, the highest level of the EPA emerging viral pathogen rule. Uh, so in the event of a new uh, virus showing up, um, we do and will be uh, approved for that type of use. Um, but again, concentrate is great to be using for uh, larger areas, diluting into uh, pump-up sprayers, foamers, uh, things along that nature. And so with that, really, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And if we have any questions, I'd be happy uh, to answer them, Laura. Thank you so much, Nicole, for such a great informative presentation. We did get a couple questions. Now, one, I don't think this is going to shock you, but the question is, how can you tell if the disinfectant is effective against COVID-19? Ah, perfect. Okay. So, the, uh, really, and I tried to focus on the, the emerging uh, pandemic uh, pathogen rule. So, uh, currently, for the most part, we are going to uh, look at list N. Um, so, the EPA defining that the, uh, the pathogen rule disinfectant manufacturers like ourselves or others will apply to the EPA and the EPA also looks at all registered disinfectants and puts them on to list N. And they'll put them on to list N either in this situation, either because they have been tested against uh, coronavirus 
um, a, a human coronavirus um, in the past, so showing efficacy against the same family, or the products have efficacy against uh, non-enveloped, more difficult to kill viruses. We are starting to see um, products coming out uh, with specific testing against SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, it is a long and painful process. We've had uh, three of our products uh, through the system, but only received the report for one so far. Um, and then that has to go through the EPA uh, process. The EPA does have, uh, is trying to expedite um, that type of testing. But what we are seeing, the products that are getting some of the claims first really are consumer products um, for the fact that it's, it's just so difficult to communicate to a consumer what product can and cannot kill. Um, so for a research facility and any of us that I would consider on the professional side and understanding microbiology, look, look to see if your product is on list N. You're going to search list N by the EPA number, not the brand or the product name. The uh, EPA lists the original or what we call the master registration. And so you look for the EPA number that you have on your product. Um, and that EPA number may have a different name from what your product name is, but as long as the EPA number is the same, then that's what you're looking for for that, uh, that level. Okay. Well, our next question has to do with protocols, and it is, do you always have to rinse after disinfection? Mm, that's a really good question, and I think it depends on uh, the area. So, if I'm looking at larger uh, areas where wet cleaning and we are using pump up foamers um, where we you know, have put a significant amount of product onto a surface, a, a detergent onto a surface prior to utilizing a disinfectant, then rinsing would be important because we need to remove any of the detergent on the surface. Um, before applying a disinfectant, if, it, if the disinfectant is different. And that's because surfactants and some disinfectants can, again, similar to water, can impact efficacy. You can have a chemical reaction and then you can impact the, the efficacy of the product. Now, if you're using a product that has a surfactant in it, um, then you can use that product as you are cleaning product as well as your disinfectant. If the same product is being used for the cleaning step and the disinfection step, then you're not going to create that interaction. And so you can um, utilize it in that way. And a rinse wouldn't necessarily been, be needed unless you haven't cleaned appropriately, then you do need to rinse to make certain you're removing any uh, soils from the surface. And let's just stick with the protocol theme here, because our next question is, do you have to rotate disinfectants? Oh, I love this question. Um, and I would say, I mean, I would say no, for the most part. Um, and the reason why I kind of add that caveat is when we are looking at disinfectants, there are uh, some disinfectants that have a greater potential to lead to chemical resistance. And the reason for changing uh, disinfectants is that there's a concern for chemical resistance and will my pathogens start to, um, you know, build up resistance and my disinfectant no longer has the ability to kill it. So that certainly has always been there and something to be considered. But when we're using products properly, so we know we are disinfecting, that we know we are applying them properly and achieving the contact time, then you really run, you don't run the risk of building chemical uh, resistance. Um, and certainly if you look at different chemistries, then products that leave a residue behind like quaternary ammonium compounds or phenols where um, that concentration of chemical becomes below the, what I would call the, um, the killing level, if you will, um, that's where we could lead to chemical resistance. So it's the same idea as taking antibiotics. If you don't keep the appropriate concentration in our bodies for a length of time, then you can lead to resistance or stopping them before we should. Um, where we get into oxidizing products, either uh, chlorine-based products, hydrogen peroxide-based products, because they don't leave an active on the surface, then that limits the ability to build up resistance. And so with those types of products, then no, I don't believe as long as you are, again, having all your programs in place for verifying dilution, verifying application, there's really no need to uh, to rotate. 
Well, we have time for one more question. So our very last question here is, what is the best type of white substrate to you? Mm -hmm. That is a great question. And it's hard in terms of, um, are you looking, like how you want to look at it. But personally, and if I look at my experience of working with different facilities and putting in appropriate processes, the disposable pre-moistened or pre-moistened wipes or wipes that you're going to purchase and then um, make yourself are what I would recommend. Oftentimes it looks like there could be an increased cost and people might look at it from an aspect of increased environmental impact because those do need to go into waste. But when we're looking at a process perspective uh, and some of the images that I had shown, they readily release they actually cover a larger surface so you're reducing the amount of product that you need to use um, and it doesn't allow your cleaning staff to continue to use it because when the solution is gone there's nothing left and so it also helps from that protocol perspective of you have to change you have to use a new uh, a new wipe so you uh, generally do a far better um, aspect. And I can cite a number of different um, peer-reviewed studies that have been done comparing um, different products within hospital facilities in particular, but even within the lab animal research, there's been a number of uh, um, studies or, or research posters that have been presented at ALAS looking at different uh, aspects. And so I would tend to lean towards um, the disposables for the fact that better application, we're not having an issue with laundering, and it's a better visual in my uh, personal perspective. Well, that's all the time we have today. So thank you, Nicole, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Here are the references that were used for today's presentation and the next few webinars in this series, so don't forget to register for those. If you have any other questions, please visit peroxyguard.com. And on behalf of Virox Technologies and our presenter, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Laura.